Good morning. Three years ago, I was experiencing end-stage renal disease or kidney failure. I was taking several strong drugs. I was on very restrictive diets and on kidney dialysis. So three days a week, I would go to the dialysis center and I would be hooked up to a machine that pumped blood from a very large catheter in my chest and filtered it and pumped it back in again. The whole process uh, took a lot of time and it was exhausting. I had to cut back my work to part-time, so my company stopped paying for my medical benefits. And I really felt pretty lousy most of the time. So my best uh, treatment option would be to get a kidney transplant. So in 2010, I uh, became eligible to receive a kidney from a deceased donor, and I was placed on the national waiting list. Now, even when you get on the list, most people still have to wait an average of four to six years uh, before a suitable donor is found. Now, fortunately, I didn't have to wait that long. When people found out about my situation, several of them came forward and uh, volunteered to be donors. I was very humbled by their generosity and will be forever grateful that they contacted the transplant center and agreed to be tested. Now, when donors are matched to uh, kidney patients, they're matched by age and body size and gender and by several blood factors known as antigens. Now, you don't have to be a perfect match to be a donor, but the better the match, the more likely the transplant is to be a success. So of the 14 people that uh, volunteered to be donors for me, the best match turned out to be, if I can get the next slide up, there we are, uh, my freshman roommate named Glenn Carlton. <laughs> Uh, no relation to William Carleton, who's the namesake of the college. But uh, Glenn is on the right here in this yearbook photo. It was taken in 1985. And uh, the other guy in the center is our third roommate uh, from freshman year, Dave Lefkowitz, who many of you recognize as an art professor here at uh, Carleton now. So now we had a willing donor and we had a, a patient, but there were still many obstacles that we had to overcome before uh, surgery was possible. In particular, Glenn lives in New Jersey, and I live here in Minnesota. And uh, there are going to be considerable expenses associated with getting him here and his family here for the surgery. Now, the problem is that uh, my insurance and, and Medicare and other insurance uh, policies in this country do not cover those kind of medical expenses. And uh, there really needs to be a national dialogue as to why that is. I mean, it should not cost the kidney donor uh, anything to come and have the surgery. But and furthermore, I was not allowed to pay for those expenses myself. I mean, I would have gladly paid any price to get Glenn here as quickly uh, as possible. But any payment by me to him would have been seen as compensation for the kidney donation, and, and that's illegal. So that's where the class of 1985 stepped in again. <laughs> Our roommate Dave put together this graphic of Stu's new kidney, Glenn style, and put it on a website, sent an email to our classmates uh, asking for donations. And they came through with uh, enough money to cover plane tickets and playing a rental car, uh, found places to stay for Glenn and his family while he was recovering from the surgery. And, um, uh, and in general, just uh, gave a, a tremendous amount of support to us uh, uh, through the whole process. So we had the surgery in November of 2010, and it went very well. As, uh, Glenn is doing just fine. He does not now and is not expected to in the future have any complications from the surgery. And uh, I'm doing just fine, too. Uh, I still have to take anti-rejection drugs for the rest of my life. But otherwise, my life is pretty much back to normal the way it was uh, before I experienced the kidney failure. So I really feel like the class of 1985 gave me my life back. <clears throat> so as I was... Uh, preparing to leave the uh, transplant center, or excuse me, the dialysis center for the last time, I you know, thanked the staff and uh, got ready to leave. And uh, I looked back and uh, saw the 10 or so other people who were still there connected to the machines. And while I was glad to know that if things went well, I would not be uh, back, but I was also disheartened to know that they would not have the same opportunities that I did. And uh, many of them were uh, patients that had multiple medical issues and would not be eligible for a transplant. 
But many of them were there strictly because there were not enough organs available uh, for transplants. And in fact, the statistics on this are, are rather bleak. Uh, currently, there are over 117,000 people on the transplant list awaiting a transplant. And of those, over 95,000 need a kidney. The reason for that is that we're able to keep kidney transplants patients alive on dialysis for years or, or even decades while they're waiting to find a suitable donor. Now, last year in 2012, there were over 16,000 kidney transplants performed in the United States. And 11,000 of those had uh, donations from deceased donors, and uh, over 5,700 uh, donations came from living donors. Now, I, I bring this up for a couple of reasons. First, I, I was kind of surprised when I saw the statistic because of the transplant recipients that I've talked with. Most all of them received their, donor, their kidneys from living donors. And in fact, all of the kidney donors that I've talked to have also been living. <laughs> but it also illustrates that uh, if we are to increase the number of organs available for donation, we can count on some coming from altruistic living donors, but the majority of those are going to have to come from an increase in organs available from deceased donors. So, in fact, 18 people are going to die waiting for a transplant every day off of the waiting list. That's over 540 this month and over 6,500 this year. And as I got to reading and thinking more about this after my transplant, I realized that there's something fairly simple that can be done to improve that. So we can switch from an opt-in system of organ donation to an opt-out system. Now, what does that mean? Well, in this country, we have an opt-in system where in order to be an organ donor, you need to give your consent while you're living, and you need to make that those wishes known by either signing up with a registry or by checking a box when you renew your driver's license. In an opt-out system, you're presumed to give your consent unless you register with an organ uh, registry or if you uh, check a box on your driver's license. And the effect of this can be rather profound. Uh, here's an often cited uh, chart from a, a paper by Johnson and Goldstein. And it shows the different rates of organ donation in various European countries. Uh, as you may have guessed, the countries in the right, on the right in blue, have an opt-out system of organ donation. And the countries in yellow have an opt-in system. And what they found was that countries that are very similar geographically and politically and have similar cultures uh, and religions have very different rates of organ donation. For example, Germany is very low at about 12%, while Austria is very high at over 99%. Similarly, uh, Denmark has a very low level of uh, organ donation, while Sweden is very high. And uh, as you may have guessed, the, the only reason for this is because some of these countries have opt-out systems and some have opt-in. And as you may have also guessed, the United States falls in line with other opt-in countries at an organ donation rate of about 20%. Now, this paper is also often uh, cited because it reflects and shows the power of the default option. Now, the default option is what happens when you make a decision and you do nothing. So um, many people will choose a default option if they do not have particularly strong feelings either way about the issue. So who would this affect by switching to an opt-out system? Well, if we look at 100% of the population of the United States, we find that approximately 70% of the population would prefer to be organ donors when they die, and about 30% would prefer not to be. Uh, that uh, is based on the best available uh, statistics, but that can vary by state by state, region by region, and it can vary study to study. And as we just saw in the Johnson and Goldstein example, it depends a lot on how you ask the question. So if we then look further at those groups, of those that would prefer to be uh, organ donors, approximately 20% have 
indicated their wishes and have signed up uh, either on a registry or by indicating on their driver's license. Of those that do not want to be organ donors, uh, about 5% will make that same kind of, uh, of indication. Now, it's based on the experience of uh, several European countries. But we need to look at the large majority in the middle and what would be the effect on them. So on the one hand, if we look at those who do not wish to be organ donors, what's the risk we have if we make a mistake with them? Well, we risk offending the relatives and the loved ones of the person who's uh, making the donation. And we also would have the medical establishment that is responsible for making those decisions take a, a hit to their credibility. On the other hand, if we make a mistake with those who want to be organ donors, but we do not harvest their organs, we run the risk of three to four, as many as eight people are going to die. Now, for me personally, the risk associated with that first group is far outweighed by the risk associated with the second group, and that's a risk that we live with all the time and a mistake that we make every day. Now, some argue that just having the organs available for donation would not necessarily lead to greater organ procurement. And the reason that uh, cited for that is that there's many steps that need to happen between having a willing donor or a deceased donor and actually having the transplant operation. So first of all, you need to have an organ procurement organization that works with the family and the hospital and uh, is ready to help make those decisions. Then you need to have a surgical team in place with uh, experienced people and equipment uh, who can successfully harvest the organs. Uh, next, you have to have an organization that matches donors and uh, recipients. In this country, that's the United Network of Organ Sharing, and that works rather well. Then you have to have effective transportation to rapidly get the organ from where it is to where it's needed. You need to have a transplant surgery center with a ready transplant patient. Now, many countries don't have this infrastructure set up and in place, and so many organs that would be available for transplant go unused. But uh, the good news is that in this country, we have that infrastructure in place and it's working just fine. In fact, the United States is among the leaders in the world in organ procurement rates. This is a chart that shows uh, donor procurement rates for different countries from the years uh, 1992 to 2002. And the countries that have an opt-out system are listed at the top, and the countries that have an opt-in system are listed at the bottom. And while generally the rates are higher for those that have an opt-out system, we still see that the United States, excuse me there, falls in line with other countries uh, that, uh, that have an opt-in system, but they're still among the leaders in the world for organ procurement rates. Now, uh, while that is encouraging, I still believe that if we switch to an opt-out system, we could at least equal the rates that are seen by Spain, Austria, and Belgium, and that would do a lot of good. So what we have is a demonstrated need for more organ transplants, and we have a way that we could increase the number of organ procurements. Now, 18 people are going to die today, and over 6,000 this year while waiting for an organ transplant. Think of the lives that we could save by switching to, from an opt-in to an opt-out system. Just think of the people that we could take off the waiting lists and out of the dialysis centers. And think of the people who could, like me, get their lives back. Thank you. <laughs>